This is Saving the Game, a Christian podcast about tabletop role-playing and collaborative storytelling. Recorded Thursday, February 7th of 2019, it's episode 146. In this episode, the Sixth Commandment Against Adultery, as part of our ongoing series on the Ten Commandments. Plus, transitioning into a horror arc as part of a larger campaign, yet another game Grant's running, why we're still not playing Eberron, quite a lot of scripture about adultery, and more. Welcome to Saving the Game, I'm Grant. I'm Peter. And I'm Jenny. How's everybody doing? Uh, You know, I'm here. Yeah. Starting to order some new books for the library for spring. Hooray! Peter, yeah. you uh, you still alive over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I live. All right. Um, I've been battling something on the continuum of chest infection. I'm not sure whether it's walking pneumonia, bronchitis, or just a nasty chest cold. Take your pick. But I have been the Lord of Phlegm for the last few days, and I'm finally better. Well, not all the way, but getting much better. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I also we got kind of a a little bit of a work note. I'm getting to play around with a little bit of newer modular server technology, some blade type stuff Mm -hmm. that I haven't before. So that's kind of cool. That is fun. Yeah. Yeah. This week has been miserable at work. It's been absolutely crazy. So Uh. I've had a I've had a really great week at work. (laughs) I'm glad (laughs) because like I'm starting the book order and I'm starting a thing for Valentine's Day. Uh, Have you ever have you guys ever heard of a blind book date? No. Yeah, I've, I've heard of this. Yeah, so for for those who don't know, it's uh basically what I've done, and there's a couple different ways to do it, but the way that I've done it is I've taken some books off the shelf that, for whatever reason, are great, but haven't been taken out, or were, like, misfiled for ages, and so just haven't been taken out for that reason or whatever, and I've wrapped them up in wrapping paper or construction paper or whatever, printed off new barcodes for them, and slapped those on the front and then whited out the metadata for that, and then... Uh, I've put on like four or five labels, a very basic description of what the book is about. Hmm. So like the first label is uh, what section of the library it's from, and then very vague genre, and then subcategories within that. Cool. I went a little more detailed than some people do. Like some people literally just go like, it's a mystery book, and that's it. Right. Um, And the library, uh, the librarian previous to me printed off the first line of every book that she put out oh, that's on display cool. which oh it, it was cool it didn't really work though okay. because it was like really spoilery for a lot of kids books sure i can see that because like winnie the pooh went through the force you know it's a winnie the pooh book right right my way is a lot simpler and less fancy um but yeah the kids have been loving it the adults have been like eh about it anyway i've been uh, that's been really fun i've been having a lot of fun with that at work that is really cool i like that yeah nice all right yeah (laughs) let's talk a little bit about gaming here um i was super excited about our eberron game and uh i'm still super excited about the next session of our eberron game which hopefully will happen this time (laughs) yeah me too i uh, (laughs) You know, it's like I said, that that first one was like, oh, it's going to be a long week. What I should have said is it's going to be a long three weeks yeah. because we've missed two sessions due to various life stuff from people. Yeah. Yeah. And and one of them was kind of short notice where all of a sudden we had friends coming in, spending the night with us and you <laughs> surprise can't really, house guest. Yeah. Well, although it was kind of funny because we still ended up talking about gaming and I'll get to that in a sec. <laughs> yeah, we had we ended up having like a total of 10 people in our house, which was great fun. Oh, goodness. Well, the kids are finally old enough that they can play with our friend's kids who are just a mm. little bit older than each of them, relatively speaking. We were finally able to just sort of like let them run loose in the house and do very little oversight. And we got to be adults and talk <laughs> and sit down for a meal with our friends. And it was amazing. <laughs> it was so good. But it was an incredibly good weekend. And then the weekend before that just Everything went wrong for everyone, and yeah, bad times. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm hoping this could work. We're we're kind of floating around some ideas of like little things we might do for nights where the whole game can't happen. We'll talk about those. I think if they happen at some point, I don't want to necessarily get into those in detail. Yeah, I will say that some of it's been player generated, which is kind of nice. Like we were kicking some stuff around in our gaming group's Discord. And uh, yeah, like Chrissy was like, hey, you know, this or this could be for a low attendance night. And it was just kind of like, oh, yeah, that would work. Yeah. So it, do- it is kind of help that 
I mean, again, I said I didn't want to get into it, but like, you know, you're sort of doing a crime adjacent kind of game. And so, hey, what side hustles are going on is always (laughs) interesting or what's a specialist one off story like those things work really well. Yeah. Now, I said I was talking about gaming. Uh, this aside from the fact that the the folks we had up were the GM and I would say main player, lead player, group lead, as it were, in our birthright game that went on for like 10 years. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's a gaming heavy group. One of them's doing a superhero game. Um, I'm told that the vampire game that came after the mage game that went on for three and a half years that I was in that was supposed to be a six week game. Let me guess, still in the thing. prologue? Oh, no, it's wrapping up. Apparently, the only way to wrap up the game is to literally make the world fall apart, which is oh. what happened to the mage game. <laughs> Basically, if there's no, if there is no universe, literal universe, for the game to happen in, the game has to end. <laughs> So if reality stops, so does the game. Yeah. Okay. That, that's apparently the only way to end this game. Which is kind of hilarious. Uh, But it's funny that I mentioned Vampire because apparently I'm going to be GMing Vampire. All right. Well, you have fun with that. (laughs) Yeah, I will. So what happened, and I kind of want to talk about this a little. One of the members of our our other gaming group, the one that isn't Peter and Jenny and my wife and two other people, mentioned during a, a social call that we were doing where we were all sitting around playing Stardew Valley and talking that they wanted to do some gaming kind of away from the rest of the group because... She works pretty hard and feels very inexperienced as a player compared to the kind of people who are in that group as well, who've been gaming for decades, literally. Like, this is what they do. Right. And she enjoys the hobby, but she hasn't had the time to put into getting good at it, she feels. Now, I think she's better than she gives herself credit for. But she doesn't feel like she knows how to role play the a character. Critical well. ones always are right, oh, but yeah. like I, I understand what, when she says that she doesn't feel like she knows how to role play well and things like that because her gaming experience has largely been with like eight person groups. Oh, and yeah, she, that's a lot of voices to oh, stick yeah. out in. So, and if you're not an alpha player, you're gonna get drowned out at some point. Exactly. Heck, if you are an alpha player, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and she's not an alpha player, and just by virtue of her schedule, she's exhausted and often falling asleep during the late night game sessions, which are the only time we can game. So <laughs> this is what is known as a suboptimal set of circumstances. Exactly. Yeah. She was like, hey, I want to do a little one off game or like I want to do a new player game. I was like, well, you know, we know this other person from the other game group I'm in that's also brand new to gaming. You want to do a game? And then my wife, my wife's friend and my wife are doppelgangers to the point where people still mix them up constantly in conversation. (laughs) It's kind of amazing. (laughs) They're like, yeah, let's do this. You know, we'll just kind of turn it into like a girls game night slash new player game. Grant, you want to GM this? Huh? Yeah. All right. (laughs) So that got me roped in. And then we had a fourth player join uh, just as part of the conversation. And they all decided on vampire, which is not what I expected at all. But they wanted gothic horror. They wanted fun. They wanted a system that a couple of them were nominally familiar with, and they wanted to do something none of them had ever really done. And I think there's a certain element of wanting to take ownership of World of Darkness games for themselves, because for all of them, it's sort of been the game the spouses played. Right. With the exception of the one person we added right at the end, who has some actual experience with Vampire. Well, our new player doesn't have any experience with World of Darkness at all. Right. And World of Darkness is kind of one of the intro games for a lot of people. Mm Mm-hmm. Especially for like more drama based, like theater based people. Exactly. So it's four different women and then me as the GM. Everybody's fairly new except for one player and I I guess me. I I would say I would say that nobody with the last name of Woodward in that group really qualifies as new anymore. (laughs) Yeah, probably not. Chrissy thinks of herself as a a new player, but she's got she's been gaming for like seven years just with us. Yeah. And so she's got talent in it and she knows she knows her way around it. But she's very yeah. limited in the systems she's been exposed to. Yeah, and extra system exposure is very good. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, that's one of the reasons why I've always enjoyed Fear the Con, is I get a chance to play two or three different systems that I've never tried before. Yeah. Also, yeah. this is a game that she's taking the initiative in getting started and, and going with, which is kind of a new thing for her. So that's pretty cool. 
it's good. Yeah. So I can't necessarily even say that we're going to actually do the game because right now it's just in the planning stages, but we're scheduled to talk about it this weekend and kind of decide where we want to set the game, what the general tenets are, kind of a session zero part one. Yeah. We already have people making characters and picking wall decorations for their apartments. So... (laughs) Our new character, <laughs> or our, our new player found some really cool character art that she shared with our kind of our main gaming group. That's the thing. Yeah. So it's really hard to not look up vampire goth art and go, mm-hmm. yeah, this would be in my my haven, my vampire retreat. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. It's the 90s. <laughs> and we are doing 20th anniversary edition vampire because we all kind of like old world of darkness. And we are going to make this like a 90s game. This is gonna Perfect. Be, oh. This is gonna be deep in like the gothy nineties. At the apex of all of that vampire-y stuff. Oh, Perfect. absolutely. Yeah. It's going to scream and rice. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Oh boy. Yeah. I may have to read an Anne Rice book. <laughs> oh no. Oh. Okay. I shouldn't I shouldn't I shouldn't be disparaging. <laughs> I I have I honestly I've never read any of her stuff. I'm just angry at the way that she handles fan fiction. Well, yeah, there's a problem there, obviously. But yeah. that's separate from the quality of the writing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm guessing she handles it litigiously, Jenny, or? Uh, literal lawsuits. Yeah, that would be litigiously. Like, she's the reason why there were disclaimers all over fanfiction.net of, I don't own, please don't sue. That's wh- where that came from, because Anne Rice sued a lot of people. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's the Kevin Simbita of the fiction world. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> uh, having said that, I have watched Interview with the Vampire and Queen of the Damned. I'm ashamed to say that Queen of the Dan was on TBS a lot when I was, you know, home alone. And I've probably, I think I've seen the whole movie. I can't say I've seen the whole movie <laughs> end to end. <laughs> Not at once, but I've seen the whole thing. Yeah. I have no idea what the chronology of events are, but I think I've seen them all. Yeah. Yeah. But I have, I, I did watch Interview with the Vampire and that was good. So I haven't read the books, but I've, I'm at least a little familiar with the content. Mm. Anyway. It'll be fun. We'll see what comes of it. Yeah, I I heard about this and it's like, you guys are all going to have so much fun. And I'm so glad that nobody has even asked me to be in this because vampire is not my jam. Well, and we're doing the lighter end of vampire if there is such a thing. Like, it's still going to be gothy and tragic and there's going to be monstrous events happening and that sort of thing because that's part of the the game, right? It's that, that gothy element to it. But we're not going to be wallowing in the deep end. Right. But even so, like... No, you you couldn't stand it. You couldn't stomach it. And we know that. (laughs) It is not for you. No. If we're going to go with World of Darkness games that are acceptable for me, we need to start with, like, Mage the Ascension. Mage (laughs) is real good, though. I love me some Mage. Oh, Mage is... Anyway... Before one we turn of, this one of my into, favorite uh, settings ever, but anyway, yeah. yeah. Before we turn <laughs> into uh, a White Wolf podcast by accident, let's go ahead and do a Patreon question, shall we? Yeah, cool. let's do that. I found my die this time. Yeah. Uh-huh. This is from John and Jenny Swan. Oh, some of our newer Patreon subscribers. Yes. So, and this is a long question. I am running a Torg game. For those that don't know, Torg is a game where multiple different realities have invaded different areas of Earth, forcing their reality onto those regions. Each realm has its own feel and way of achieving that. I plan to run an adventure in the horror realm, Rorsch. How would you advise running a horror adventure in a campaign where it is not the every game thing? How do I get my players to shift from more lighthearted play with table talk to being more serious? Ironically, a a somewhat relevant question, given that we were just talking about this with Vampire, sort of, the opposite. So I think one of the things is maybe don't be too harsh about the table talk. First of all, ask them. Just be like, hey, we're going into a horror thing. This is a little more serious. Try and keep, you know, stuff a little more focused. We want to set a mood here. And if your players are at all mature, they're going to at least try. Now, old habits die hard and, you know, it can be hard to stick with that if that's not what you're used to, but you can probably get at least a good session or two out of it before the group personality asserts itself, Mm -hmm. so to speak. But I would say like the very first thing to do is just be very blunt about it. Like, Hey, we're going into a horror area here, guys. Let's try and shift the mood a little bit. Yeah. I'm not going to pretend like I've ever played a horror game seriously. Like at least not. I I think I've played a fairly serious game. I, I, I'm, I was just about to say I'm excluding convention games from this because like a lot of the advice that I'm about to redirect to is not for convention games at all. But Fear the Boot actually did a pretty dang decent 
episode on horror games ages and ages ago. It was literally one of the first episodes I ever listened to when I was about 14. So yeah, that's like an 11 year old episode or so. But one of the things that they really emphasized was if you can control the environment around the table as much as possible in terms of like lighting, maybe even background music, that kind of thing so that everybody has that visual cue constantly. We are serious. This is a scary thing. The other thing I might recommend, and I think this works well given the nature of the game that you're playing and running where there's a horror area that you have to physically go to, Mm -hmm. build up to it. You're not going to start with the worst sort of horror. If you try and throw them into the deep end of shock, you're just going to get people either to check out or to laugh it off. Start getting more and more serious as you go. Raise the stakes a little and don't have NPCs there to lighten the mood or, you know, joke events happening. You yourself need to get a little more serious and then a little more serious and a little more serious and build up into that. And that, first off, it plays well into the traditional trope of rising horror, but also your players won't really notice. I've seen this happen a lot where as things get more and more serious, the table talk dies down because we're all having to focus and we're all having to pay attention. Exactly how to do it. I don't know the the game that you're playing well. Like, I don't know Torg at all, so I don't know if there is anything you can do to mechanically reinforce it. But if you can, great. I, I think that's probably the way to, to approach it. Now, I do agree that you're going to always have table talk. And table talk's important in a horror game. Because it's how people deal with the tension. You're, you're going to get table talk, you're going to get jokes, but that doesn't mean people aren't taking it seriously. It's how they're blowing off steam. Yeah, and there needs to be some of that release. If you just build pressure endlessly, people are going to either check out entirely or you run the risk of like actually traumatizing people well, and that is not what you want to do at the table. You're probably not going to actually traumatize anyone mm-hmm. unless you're really hitting some some really nasty lines and veils, but yeah. You know, yeah. but you, I mean that can happen. It can, but my point is is less about the lines and veils things and more just, you know, you're naturally creating tension. That's what horror is, right? It's tension right. and suspense and you need an outlet for that. That's why horror movies ha- have ups and downs, right? You you rise, 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 go to a climax, and then it relaxes. I guess the other thing that I would say is um, if you've got somebody who's like, man, that's going to be really hard for me to get into that kind of a mood or something. I'm a little hesitant to recommend this in this context, but consume something really just kind of grim on your way to the session, like fire up one of the episodes of Hardcore History about the First World War or something. And and not one of the ones at the beginning where it's talking about the causes of it. One of the ones in the middle where it's talking about just how awful some of the battles were and stuff. That'll snap the humor right out of you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or a Call of Cthulhu actual play or something yeah. like that. Something to get you in the headspace. Yeah. You know, a really terrible metal. <laughs> <laughs> There's good metal, but... Pick something terrible that makes everything awful. There's there's your solution. <laughs> All right. John, Jenny, thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's a good question. And if anyone else wants to get their questions in, including existing Patreon backers, reach out to us through our Patreon. And if you aren't a supporter on Patreon, just go to patreon.com slash saving the game. For as little as a dollar a month, you get to ask however many questions you want. And as a reminder to our existing Patreon supporters, if you have submitted questions in the past, that doesn't mean you need to wait until we read yours to submit future questions. Go ahead and get them in. Anything you want doesn't have to be gaming related. I mean, we appreciate gaming ones. They're fun, but it can also be like, how was lunch? Any questions, fine. Okay, let's get our scripture done, shall we? Sure. Yeah, there's a bunch of it. We have a lot, but the first one's real easy. Who wants to take it? Uh, I'll take the first two if you guys don't mind. Sure, go for it. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. All right. And I'll take 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. 
David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. And the next one we have is Matthew five twenty-seven to 30 You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. And we have Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 27. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. John chapter 8, verses 3 through 11. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. And we have 1 Corinthians six eighteen through 20 Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So, in case you could not tell from the scripture we read, we are talking about adultery. Yep, we are on the seventh commandment tonight. The seventh yep. commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And, okay, first things first, we're going to be talking about sex in this episode. Content not warning. Not like details, but like, it's going to get discussed yeah. as, as a subject. So, like, this may not be your family's, your own family. But this may not be the most child-friendly episode we do. Yeah. <laughs> like, if you haven't had that talk with your kids, maybe, eh, you know. Yeah. Also, <laughs> this is, we know this is two heavy ones in a row. Eh. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, you know, we're going to do another theological episode probably after this. Probably not as heavy, though. Probably not as heavy. But that's all right. This one is complicated. And as you can probably tell, the Bible has a lot to say about adultery and sexual immorality. But I want to start off with a question. Why is you shall not commit adultery a commandment at all? I mean, it seems like just a, a private thing, a problem in a marriage and presumably a adulterer or adulteress as well, you know, three people. Why, why is that in there? Right there between thou shalt not murder and thou shalt not steal. So here's an interesting fact. Jeffrey Chaucer, of all people, wrote an interesting answer to this. Uh, this is from the Parsons tale in the Canterbury Tales. And I'm going to read I think, from what I believe is the Riverside Chaucer translation. Understand also that adultery is set commonly in the Ten Commandments betwixt theft and manslaughter. For it is the greatest theft that may be, for it is theft of body and of soul. And it is similar to homicide, for it carves in two and breaks in two them that first were made one flesh. We can't really talk about adultery without talking about marriage. Adultery is a sin against marriage because it breaks what is intended to be, and when it's functioning well is, a union of flesh and soul and God. 
that's what a marriage is. And that union of flesh is important. I warned you we're going to be talking about sex in this episode. That that part matters too. Now, not every marriage is going to have sexual activity in it. There are marriages that are perfectly great and very holy that have very little, if any. There are some that are probably very sexually active. Most are somewhere in between those two extremes. Probably, yeah. But the point is, you know, that's that's the details of an individual marriage, but that is not something that is left out of a marriage. This commandment, don't commit adultery, is made for us, not us for it, because it's a rule for people, like all of these Ten Commandments, because we are flawed people and we're made in the image of God, and God knows what rules we need. That's why they're there. Just as the Sabbath is made for us, not people to serve the Sabbath, so too with this commandment and all the rest of the law. There's a bit I want to read from J. Ellsworth Collis's The Ten Commandments from the Backside. He's got a pretty good chapter on this, not something that works well to read or discuss on this podcast, unfortunately, but it's it's good and I recommend you pick up the book. But I want to include this this bit that he ends the chapter with. How good of God to equip us with bodies which are wonderfully spiritual, possessed of longings which are driven by both glands and soul, fearfully and wonderfully made? Indeed. So having entrusted us with such powerful, indeed combustible, equipment, God also left instructions for its use. You shall not commit adultery. Or to put it another way, you shall cherish the sacredness which is inherent in you and in your mate, because this is the only way it will work. That's the way you and I are made. So what was adultery considered to be in the various biblical eras? Um, I think we all would probably guess, don't have sex with someone else's spouse. But as Deuteronomy and Leviticus are so keen to do all the time, there are rules about what is and is not considered adultery and what is a punishable offense. Specifically, Deuteronomy 22 and Leviticus 20, those contain a lot of like the big details for the sinful acts and the punishments to go with them related to adultery and fornication and that kind of thing. And they can all pretty much be summed up as don't have sex with animals. Don't have sex with somebody else's spouse, don't do incest, don't do rape, and don't have premarital sex. And a lot of the punishments for those things is death. A lot of stoning happens. I was able to find one that you only get exiled, you know, so only exile. And a couple of the other ones involve paying people large sums of money. And that's because marriage was not considered for a long time. And and you see this throughout a lot of cultures throughout the world with dowries and that kind of thing. Marriage was about ownership and property. Yeah. So in the case of two unmarried individuals um, having sex, the man would have to pay the woman's father. And then immediately they would have to get married and they would not be allowed to divorce under any circumstances. So that paying of money would be compensating the father for the loss of the daughter and essentially buying the daughter. Paying for stolen goods, as it were. Yeah, Yeah. very, very much like quite literal ownership contract kind of thing would happen. Marriage isn't like this today, mostly. Uh, Hopefully we try to make it not like that. So, uh, I mean, hopefully the, the payment thing doesn't apply anymore. And hopefully also that we, we don't kill each other over this anymore, hopefully. Yeah, certainly. Certainly not as a uh, state-induced punishment. That's no, for sure. definitely not. So that's that's adultery, roughly speaking. We, we have not gone into details. I think we all kind of generally know what adultery is. We don't have to explain it very much. So how do we game this? Because... At first glance, this doesn't seem super gameable, right? Again, it's a thing that happens I mean, between adults that's typically private. You guys have a very different experience of gaming than I do because I grew up gaming in the era where like you would joke about banging the bar wench and stuff like that to use a very vulgar term, but that was the term that was used at the time. So yeah. so like for me, this was like a topic I was sort of like I knew immediately what I would be able to talk about because the whole having sex with the bar wench thing was so, so incredibly common. Sure. When, and it's not like when I was in high school, I'm not exposed to that, you know, but yeah. my, my gaming groups, traditionally speaking, have either not been the kind of people who do that 
or we've done games where we're dealing with like epic scopes and whole nations and that sort of low level character interaction almost doesn't happen at all. Yeah. Oh, really? It's more because strategy like, we, game we, than yeah, like we birth had like game. the vast scope thing going on, and yet as a, they to be fair, my group generally waited until I was like missing for a game or something to do that kind of gross joke. But like, yeah, no, the the world could be ending, and yet there would be the bar wench, right? And it is a very common trope and it does harken back to that sword and sorcery tradition yeah i mean it even shows up in some of the more popular actual plays i think yeah critical role started off with the first episode yeah the very yeah. first episode that shows up in there i was kind of yeah there there are two characters in particular who are known for frequenting brothels in places that they go to yeah it just, was kind of a really like, this is what i'm getting into kind of a thing yeah yep. they, they definitely sort of play it up as a joke they've i think they've mostly stopped it as a joke now now that they have like an audience and they're like oh we have to care about this yeah um i I haven't listened to happy jack's rpg podcast in a long time but they um do a lot of listener mail or did i don't maybe they've changed their format but back when i was listening to them they were doing lots of listener mail and they usually included a gaming horror story of some sort and like 80 percent of those involved something related to this some dude always a dude doing Something sexual at the table that made everyone uncomfortable. It's unfortunately or still a problem. really upset even sometimes, you yes, know, uncomfortable yeah. uh, encompassing a broad range of reactions to be sure. Yeah. Uh, starting with uncomfortable and getting worse from there. This is a trope that exists. If you're going to use this in your games, think about why. Like if you're just trying to titillate, just trying to get laughs, eh, probably not great. If you're trying to indicate poverty and desperation and degeneracy in a particular area of the game, maybe there's some value in that. In the Eberron game, for example, I've mentioned brothels a couple of times because there are red light districts in Sharn. And that's not there to be like, hey, folks, who's going to the brothel? It's, hey, this is a thing that goes on in this game and there's seedy activity and other stuff going on and organized crime. And it's probably a terrible place, but it's also a big tourist attraction you want to see a huge body count in your game let us find a human trafficking operation that's forcing <laughs> people into that yeah we'll burn yeah. half the city down before we're done well, mm-hmm. well your your character probably would absolutely mm-hmm. and so with the warforged character so yeah, there's would. a couple of them yeah. absolutely but the point is you know i'm not including that because oh boy brothels i'm going yeah this is part of the setting too we can't just ignore the gross bits of the world right. in the hopes that they'll go away. Exactly. And there are some that are really interesting. Like, what happens when there's a brothel populated by changelings and shapeshifters? One of them is basically like a fleshy holodeck, where it's not even sexual fantasies. It's, hey, I need to practice this marriage proposal I'm going to do. I'm going to bring you a portrait of the woman I'm proposing to. I'd like you to, you know, pretend to be her, use disguises and your shapeshifting magic and all that stuff. And if you can create illusions in the room of like where I plan to propose to her, and then I need to rehearse this. Still a little weird, but yeah, it's it's a lot less creepy. It's a lot less creepy, mm-hmm. but like that's a thing that's there and it's it's a cool setting piece. But of course it is also, you know, it's a brothel. It's shapeshifters, sleep with whoever you want. Yeah. So yeah. it's part of the game, but I'm not trying to turn it into a joke. Yeah. Now you can also, there are monsters both from traditional mythology and added into games like D&D that are designed to appeal to this or talk about the the terrors and dangers of sexuality, you know, succubi and incubi and so on. These are often rooted in uh, some unpleasant patriarchal ideas, but they exist. They may have uses in your game. Vampires, certainly, have always been a, a very sexual monster. In general, a lot of a lot of monsters from like the kind of thing that you'd hear in old fairy tales and folk tales and stuff like that. A lot of the time they are rooted in misogyny and, and sexual kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and a lot of them just straight up are what makes them dangerous. Their sex appeal. I mean, that's what yeah. the siren yeah. is, for example. Yeah. I'm not going to say avoid them. I'm going to say think about why you're using them. Is there think an alternative? I, I, think the, I think the analogy that, I, that we should use for this sort of thing is this is a really strong spice. <laughs> this this isn't like black pepper or something. This is this is ghost pepper. So apply very small amounts. Yeah, and make know? sure your party and players can handle it if it shows yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm also not suggesting 
that PCs need to be morally upright at all times. Peter put that in the show notes, and then he put that disclaimer in specifically so that I wouldn't yell at him, apparently. But, you know, the the PC who always is going to the brothel or picking up barmaids or, hey, ladies, it's so tiresome and it's squeaky. Yeah, it just gets old. It yeah. just gets really, it's old. It's tiresome. It is. It's kind of creepy, too. It can be. It can be, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen it not be. <laughs> I have. In your game? Eh... Uh... It's never really on camera. It's more of like an implied thing about a couple of the characters. And that's what makes it somewhat less squeaky. Yeah, but I'm I'm thinking like any of it playing out as a an on camera in character oh, yeah. kind well, of the, an action oh, oh, kind no, of a thing. Don't do that. Just in general yeah. in general, don't do that. But I'm talking about like the the implied bit, you know? My yeah, wife and Calista I are making and Hala jokes. both have a little bit of that, but it's it's not like they're actually role playing hitting on various people in the setting because that would kind of be weird. Yeah, yeah. Now, mind you, that is something that my character is going to sort of slightly touch on, where Hala is going to not be, you know, going out picking up dudes, but is, she's going to be going on dates a lot. Yeah, you know. And I talked with you about that before, and that's just a fun part of the character where she's on dates and it's not going out sleeping around. It's like, yeah, let's see how this guy is. Found him on, I don't know, Fantasy Tinder or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Fantasy Craigslist. <laughs> Sigiled right. <laughs> you know, Chrissy and I make jokes back and forth because we are married. And, yeah. you know, I would not do that with anyone else at the table. But, you know, that's part of it. And we try to keep it palatable for the rest of the table because we know what the limits of the table are. But that's something that we do occasionally just as, eh, you know, it's us. Yeah, you two are a married couple. Yeah, it's. Yeah. We're very careful not to alienate the rest of the group. Yes. And the rest of the group notices and appreciates that. So. Yes. Uh, just kind of a general bit of advice here that Grant has already kind of touched on by implication, but we're going to beat this drum forever. The people around the table are the most important thing at the table. They are more important than the fiction, more important than the fiction making sense. If something is upsetting somebody, retcon it as hard as you have to to make them unupset and worry about the fictional implications later. Yeah. Now, we talked about this in our Virtues and Vices series, especially when we were talking about chastity. Adultery can be a convenient marker of villainy. Certainly, wealth and power seem to be one of those things that make people uh, less likely to stay in bed, at least as a storytelling trope. In reality, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, in my, I think it is to a certain extent. In, in my experience, mm -hmm. social status doesn't have a whole lot of bearing on fidelity, judging by a lot of the stories I have heard. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there is that that trope, that idea of power corrupting and that idea of, you know, money buying more and more exotic and hedonistic pleasures. Yeah. You know, kings taking advantage of power to flander, to not be proper husbands, proper wives, yeah. right? <laughs> proper kings. I mean, look at David. Yeah. Mm -hmm. David, again, David, you know, willing to kill to keep uh, things convenient, yep. right? To just sort of put a veneer of respectability on it. Well, you know, he's dead. Sure, he died because of my specific orders and, and all that, but he's dead. And after the, the mourning period, eh, look, it looks like we're okay to marry now. Yeah. Again, strong spice. Be careful with this. It can be one of those things that makes people uncomfortable, but it's one of those wonderfully vicious things that can set a whole kingdom on fire. Yeah, if you've and, got a court with a yeah. bunch of, of this type and other types of betrayal going on, the waves of assassinations are just going to start crashing back and forth. And it plays so well into themes of hypocrisy as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's that, is he like a bishop or a cardinal in Dishonored? Oh, the, yeah, yeah, the dude in, in the cat place. I've just heard about it. I haven't, I, I'm so far behind yeah, that game. Yeah, yeah, there's but, one, like, uh, church higher up who's in yeah. or running the brothel. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he, he runs it. He's, it's, because it's not run by a dude. I remember that. It's run by a lady. Oh, that's right. Um, but yeah, he's, like, the best, yeah. like, the primary client. Yeah, the highest paying client. I think, Grant, you were the one who said you can scan him with, like, that mind-reading heart, and it says that he violates every one of the tenets of his order every single day. It's his own private joke or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Actually, one of the better lines in that game. So there's your kind of mark of hypocrisy there. Exactly. Dishonored's a really good game. Just Oh, it's fantastic. It's really yeah, good. I'm, I, I'm playing Prey right now, and I know it's the same developer, so... Yeah, it's one of the few games that I've replayed more than... I think I've got to fully replay it at least four times. Wow. I love that game. 
<laughs> yep. I really need to try and get past the first little piece of it. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. it's really good. It's really fun looking. And it's it has that thing where you have a specific goal, but the means by which you do it are completely up to you. And there's all sorts mm-hmm. of very functional options. Oh, yeah. I'm, it's really cool. It prays very much the same way. It's just, you know, space station instead of like diesel punk fantasy. But yeah. Anyway, um, we're, we're getting off on a tangent here. A little bit. Yeah. But yeah, again. It's not always the case that the rich and powerful are the ones to whom infidelity is is restricted, but as a storytelling trope, it resonates very strongly. Yeah. Uh, And adultery overall is a powerful story archetype as a plot driver. Georges Pulte included adultery among his 36 Dramatic Situations, which is a book that he wrote claiming that all plots stemmed from one of those 36 archetypal stories. Uh, And if you think about it, there's a lot of room for story in adultery. Yeah. I mean, Downton Abbey. (laughs) There's a whole bunch of them in um, uh, Eureka, that that book of plots for RPGs. It's a whole like subcategory. Uh, Yeah. For for exactly this reason. Just to name a few, a bare few. What are the the effects like in terms of the, the mental and emotional and internal state, the dramatic effects on the deceived spouse, on the adulterers? What are the procedural effects of discovery and a nasty divorce? What are what happens when there's a dramatic reconciliation? You know, the, there's all sorts of stories. And this is just basic action. In games where even if there's no PC involved in the adultery or the marriage, you can still get a lot of action out of this. I, I'm certainly planning to in the Eberron game. The oh, Sean yeah. game. I mean, like private investigators, their most common jobs is investigating possibly cheating spouses. Exactly. Even if it's not, is my spouse cheating on me? Please find out. It's what are the results of that? You know, an infuriated spouse uh, desires some sort of humiliating or murderous vengeance. Are you delivering that? Are you being paid to do it? Are you being paid to stop it? What's going on? Uh, A murder's been committed to cover up an affair. Go investigate. You know, find out that it was to cover up an affair and and who and why, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Get me proof. Invent something that proves an alibi. There's all sorts of stories you can create around it. Or even, you know, I think this is going on and it's like, well, this isn't going on, but this other thing is going on. And yeah, a good red hair. like, I don't know whether to be more angry or less. And it's like, well, that's not a service we provide. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. oh, my husband is not sneaking off to cheat on me. He's sneaking off to uh, go worship at the cult of the mad god or whatever. OK, that's a thing. <laughs> Yep. Still going to be angry at him. Still going to have to break him of that habit. But all right. (laughs) Now I know what happens to children conceived out of wedlock. There's a whole subcategory of stories we can tell about that. Oh, yeah. Like the the lost heir, the long lost heir who's only valuable once everybody else has been ruled out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the the secret one. I mean, and this dates well past this. But of course, the classic example is Arthur. Yeah. Yep. Not only his conception, but then the whole affair between, you know, Lancelot and Guinevere. Exactly. Yep. There's a whole strain of it that runs throughout the entire Arthurian legend. Yeah. Not just Arthur and his direct lineage, but all of his knights get involved with that sort of thing as well. Yeah, there's there's a couple of things that I want to touch on here. First of all, um, you have to remember in game ideally, but especially in real life, that the kids are blameless in this, right? <laughs> they, you know. <laughs> They had no control over the circumstances of their conception. So holding that against somebody in any way is about the most unchristian thing you can do. Mm. Don't do it ever. And then there's also, uh, if you take the tack of, you know, how can this be redeemed? How can these consequences be made into something redemptive? We've talked about, like, your stereotypical Batman origin story orphaned player character, right? You know, it's, oh, I'm all alone in the world. Well, what if you're not? Maybe you have family out there that you didn't know about, Um, especially if the PC was orphaned at such an early age that they never knew their parents and then they find a family later. Mm -hmm. You know, that could be like a really poignant, heartwarming thing, especially if the family is welcoming or it could be very dramatic if they're not. You know, you can go a number of ways with it, but yeah, it can be tragedy. It can be heartwarming. It can be comedy. Dramatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can turn it into comedy in ways. I mean, it's it's a tough, it'd be a sort of black comedy, but you could do it. Yeah. <laughs> or it could just be very complicating. It's like, yeah, they're nice enough. Um, 
they're all mobbed up, but they're nice <laughs> enough to you anyways. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're the chief of police now. What are you going to do with this? You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Sort of related to that. Let's please let go of the tired cliche of half orcs that are all product of, of rape and pillage. Yeah. It's gross and nobody likes it. Yeah. And besides, tusks are incredibly attractive. So True fact. Yeah. True fact. <laughs> racial alignments are kind of problematic and lazy in their own right anyways. Oh, yeah. Don't necessarily assume that the orcs are out pillaging. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of a good thing. I get, one of the things I like about Eberron is that it very specifically got away from that. Yeah. Like there's there's a whole section of the continent of Corvair where orcs tend to live and you just have humans and orcs living together. And often they have babies and there's half orcs and the half orcs have babies. And guess what? Those yeah. are half orcs too. And it's just, yeah, we're all out here. It's fine. Yeah. This is where we live. <laughs> what are you like? I'm like three quarters orc, you know, seven sixteenths orc, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> seven sixteenths orc. <laughs> and then the person honestly, like pulls though, out an abacus and starts I've like trying to figure person. out how that would work. I've known that person though. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I, I, I'll tell you this. I actually got my genealogy merit badge in Boy Scouts, which is a real thing and says a lot about the Boy Scouts. But it was actually a lot of fun. It was something dad wanted to do as well. And so I was like, well, you know, this, there's a merit badge for this. And so my dad and I sat down and like we traced out the whole family tree. I had something like, I want to say like a 30 odd page family tree that I printed out to show Ooh. as part of the, wow. the thing. I was able to trace the Woodward line back to a John Woodward born in 1585 in London. Came to the huh. United States in 1620. Wow. Cool. It was, or 1620 or 1624. I can't remember. I don't remember the name of the ship he came on. But that's where the Woodward line came. It wasn't Mayflower, but it was like one of the one of the ships that was, you know, in that decade. So you've got a, a long history of family on this continent, yeah. too. Yeah. But then also it's like on the other side of the family, you know, and, and various other parts of the family, it's like, what is this? We don't know. Like, yeah. okay. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, um, the, the Greek side of the family, we don't know much about. The Russian side of the family, we don't know much about. This side of the family, you know, it says it's part Cherokee. Well, in the South, Cherokee was often a euphemism for black, but we, you know, down here, well, we can't say we've got any any black people in the family. So yeah, it's a Native American. Mm. Yeah, that's a yeah. thing. So For me, <laughs> my genealogy stops on one side of the family quite promptly, like only a couple generations back because my great great grandfather was found on the doorstep of a church. No, oh, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> And to get back to the topic, may well have been a, a product of, um, you know, uh, adultery. Sex out, out of wedlock. wedlock. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and you know what? Because that was a fairly common thing. Yeah, it is very common. And it's a, a good background for a character. Oh, yeah. Because it, it is one of those neat things where you can say, I was raised by something that isn't a normal family, family situation. You know, yeah, I was raised in the church. I was raised in the stables. Whatever. Have fun yeah, with it. Kitchen. <laughs> yeah. We've talked a lot about this in terms of gaming. Let's talk about outside of game. Uh, first bit of advice, don't cheat on your spouse, kids. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't cheat. Not a thing to do. Yeah. No cheating. It's rude. It, it's very rude. Yes. And that's that's definitely the reason why we don't suggest it. Uh, no. <laughs> Ma- marriage, I'll say this. Marriage does take work. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not all the time. There are times when it's the easiest thing in the world, but- you know, amidst hectic schedules and frustrated arguments and kids and bills and all the distractions of life, it's easy to stop thinking about us and start thinking about me. And once you're thinking about me and what I want, it kind of opens that door up, uh, especially yeah. when you've managed to forget under stress and, and all that, you know, in this, the sense that maybe something isn't working right, everything that brought you two together in the first place. And this is not to suggest that, you know, marriages never fail. Obviously, they do. But they do take work. And if you don't put the work in, you're not going to get much out of it. Yeah, like many other things in life, you get out what you put in. Yeah. Extend mercy and grace to people with pasts. And once again, I'm going to hit the old drum again. Something that a person had no agency in doesn't count as a past for them in terms of their worth or character. It might shape them in other ways. There's no way around that. But to argue that somebody is somehow like less valid as a person because of the circumstances of their conception or birth is pretty awful. Yeah. Yeah. Or any other situation beyond their Yeah. I mean, yeah well, let's, exactly. let's be a little more specific about this. You know, if somebody is sexually assaulted or something like that, that doesn't count against their character. Yeah. Like that's not cheating. Yeah. Yeah. Someone assaulting you is not you cheating. And I have seen that's, people make that argument. And, and, and no, you're, don't. 
your children if they are conceived in you know duress like that or something also doesn't count against them exactly you know? yeah if you don't have agency you don't take any of the blame Ex- period exactly <laughs> uh and likewise you know even if somebody did have agency in it we're all sinners there's yes, okay? we are. there's nothing <laughs> all these sins wait equally <laughs> against us you know show grace there too it's potentially hard if you're the one who, you know, was cheated on. But if you're meeting somebody who, you know, has had affairs in the past or something like that, you know, has had other relationships in the past, talk with them about it. If they're not going to change their behavior, maybe that's one thing, but allow for allow, change. Yeah, allow for change yeah. and encourage it. And if somebody has was married and had a bad marriage and is divorced, don't hold that against them. Be yeah. supportive. In fact, frankly, it's a hard process to go through. Yeah. And and finally, I, I do want to throw this out there. Given that the concern that we're kind of talking about here with, with marriage and adultery is the mental and spiritual and physical unification of two people in marriage, mental adultery is just as bad as physical adultery. Christ calls that out specifically in the, the Sermon on the Mount. And I, I do want to specifically mention pornography because it is a fairly significant problem in this moment in history. You know, it's easily accessed. It's addictive. It's often exploitative. And... Aside from pulling emotional attention away from one's spouse and mental attention away from them, it also doesn't have a lot of bearing on actual marital relations. It's stunt sex. It's made to look good on a camera. It's not actually how things go. I really recommend avoiding it if you can. And even if you're not in a marriage, it's a distraction and a drain. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that we have a whole lot else to talk about. It's kind of an awkward thing to talk about because we don't tend to think of sex and marriage as part of gaming. One thing we didn't really talk about is marriage in game. And yeah, um, one of my characters got pretty dang close to it. Unfortunately, the game collapsed before it could happen. But like, it is entirely possible to have a healthy romantic relationship be- between two characters. Sure, I managed to do it successfully uh, in a Monster Hearts game for multiple years. Um, I did talk with Tyler about it. I talked, I, well, sort of, I, I was like, spur of the moment, my character and a, another player's character kissed and it was sort of spur of the moment. And I immediately messaged Tyler on Facebook, like, Hey, my character just kissed another character. Is that okay? He's like, awesome. I'm rooting for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, and Chrissy and I talk about it too. Like, you know, when we were playing in this game, we were both kind of playing characters with a, a sexually active past for various different reasons. You know, we both spent a little time talking about it and made sure we were both okay with that. Yeah. But to get back to the, to the in-game marriage thing, I think it's underutilized. And I understand it kind yeah. of comes from the same the same reason that people are reticent to have living family members in general. Because, oh, it's a cudgel yeah. the GM can wield against you. Yeah. But Yeah, I think I played a Widower once, but that was about the extent of it. Right. But, you know, in a game where the GM isn't going to go, a family member, ah, convenient weakness, mwahaha, go ahead and have characters who are married. They're fun. Yeah. Start your character off married and happily so. See what happens. It's fun to do and you you get an NPC for free. Great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're looking for um, some inspiration for like what a married adventuring character looks like, Sam Vimes in Discworld and uh, oh, yeah. Lady Ramkin, his mm-hmm. wife, are a pretty good couple to use for an example of that. Yeah. Uh, they're, yeah. they're both pretty competent people. They get along pretty well they kind of push each other to be better it's a it's a cool thing it's a very healthy marriage if a little bit of a weird one sometimes yep. it, it is yeah. weird but it's Discworld. yeah everything in Discworld is weird and david eddings <laughs> his main characters are married and david eddings is very archetypal f- fantasy you know it, i can't say it has aged perfectly but it handles it pretty well i would say given the era that it's from and is worth a good uh, read because these are characters who don't start off married, get married, and then continue having adventures together. Yeah, I will I will say at least with Eddings, he's mostly pretty wholesome too. But yeah, so he is. I'm just thinking more of certain gender stereotypes, let's say. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> That's it is a product of its time. <laughs> it is. It's a good product of its time. It holds up reasonably yeah. well. Just go into it knowing that that is the case. Yeah. I explore that. Throw good marriages into your game as a GM. If you're ever looking for a reason for your character to not be there in a game you have to skip, say they got to go to a wedding. Yeah. yeah. When was the last time anybody did that? Come, <laughs> you know, come back with like crazy stories and half a bottle of champagne. <laughs> I'm totally using that the next time I have to see bail on a session. There we go. I mean, we could easily do it in the, the Sharn game. It's a massive scene. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, one of my buddies is getting married. All right. Well, are you in the wedding? <laughs> 
Heck, that could even be one of our jobs. You know, these people are getting married. There's some dangerous family members that might try and stop it. Please keep us safe. You <laughs> yeah, know? Wedding security. There's a jealous harpy. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> literally yeah, a jealous like, harpy. An actual harpy. <laughs> mythological harpy. Like, <laughs> this isn't a euphemism. This is as literal as can be. Yeah. Yeah. When we're talking about literal harpies, it's time to wrap up the episode. <laughs> Probably. Yep. Thank you, folks. This has been, I guess, a pretty good one. I don't know. It's an awkward topic to talk about, certainly, but it yeah. does need to be talked about. It's there in scripture a lot. Yeah. You should be talking about it in church. Let's put it that way. If you can't yeah. talk about it in church, you're, it's hard to talk about it on a podcast, but you need yeah. to do both. If you've got your own thoughts on this, again, we want to hear about those. Our Discord channel is a place for that, but of course you can tweet at us as well. If you don't know where to find our Discord channel, it's stgcast.org. There's a big link right up there in the, the menu and on the sidebar. Uh, and of course, if you follow us on Twitter at Saving the Game or on Facebook, you can find us there and, and make your way to it from there. Well, folks, have a good one. Take it easy. We'll catch you next time. See you See later, ya. folks. This has been a production of Saving the Game. All episodes are produced and published under a Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, share alike license. Our logo is by Ruben Smith Zimple of 3d6design.com. Our music is The Promised Place Beyond the Clouds by James Opie. You can find more of his music at nihilor.com. To hear our past episodes, to find syndication and license details, to connect with our fantastic listener community, or to contact us or support our show through Patreon, visit our website at stgcast.org or savingthegamepodcast.org. God bless, do good, and happy gaming.